Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Introduction to Efficient Lighting and Controls webinar. My name is Beth, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. We'd like to start off with a safety moment this morning. Safety is a core value of PGE, and we would like to remind you to be safe around electricity. As you consider installing or retrofitting new equipment, please keep safety in mind. We would also like to encourage your family and staff to be prepared with an outage kit, and you can visit our website for more safety information. And that web address is portlandgeneral.com forward slash safety. We would also like to thank the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance for their support in co-sponsoring this series of free energy efficiency trainings that are open to all Northwest utilities and their customers. Before I introduce the presenter, I'd like to show you some tools you'll be using during the webinar. To the right of your screen, you'll see the chat window, and a polling window will appear at the end of the session. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through chat to me, the host, and I will ask them of the presenter at the end of the webinar. At the top left corner of your screen, beneath the Quick Start menu, you'll see several tools, which I will circle here. A text tool, excuse me, an arrow or pointer, a text tool, and a marker. And the presenter will ask you to use these tools on specific slides during the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce this morning's presenter. Mark Whitney is with Portland General Electric, and he's our lighting specialist. For the past 16 years, Mark has been active with the local Oregon section of the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America, which is widely recognized as the lighting authority. Mark has a long history of providing lighting education to professionals and has instructed all levels of lighting courses offered through the IESNA, as well as lighting classes offered for PGE customers and employees. As a lead accredited professional, Mark is familiar with sustainability issues, particularly those that relate to lighting. Mark is lighting certified from the National Council on Qualifications for the Lighting Professions, and he received a BA in Business Administration from Carthage College, Wisconsin. And now I'd like to hand the presentation over to Mark. Thanks, Beth. Welcome everyone to today's Efficient Lighting webinar. So my intent today is that you'll find today's presentation both helpful and useful. One of my favorite things to do at PG is working with commercial industrial customers to help them with their lighting efficiency projects. So I plan to share some of my favorite tips and suggestions with you this morning. So here's today's agenda. The main themes are gonna be saving energy, saving money, and providing better quality lighting through a lighting upgrade project. So throughout this webinar, I want you to think of a lighting upgrade application at your place of business, or just pick one that you're interested in. The goal today is to supply you with information about lighting and energy efficiency that'll make a difference at your place of business. And I'll start with some lighting basics and then quickly move on and show you how to apply this information to your particular project. So we invite your active participation today. That makes this thing go much better. One way is by using the annotation tools that Beth just described on the upper left-hand side of your screen. In fact, I'll ask you to use these tools on the very next slide. And we plan to leave some time at the end to answer any questions you might have. These are the key learning objectives for today. So if you would, uh, please look these over and use one of your annotation tools that uh, we talked about, uh, an arrow or something like that, uh, to indicate to me which one of these are of most interest to you today. During the early part of the presentation, we'll focus on how to get light to the work plane effectively and efficiently. Throughout the presentation, I'll share several energy-saving lighting upgrade applications. While the focus is going to be on retrofit, new construction is going to apply also. And toward the end, we'll go over how to save energy with controls by focusing on occupancy sensors today. And after we've learned a few things, I'll let you know how you can get help with your lighting upgrade project. And it looks like most of you are interested in applications and controls. Thanks very much. So let's begin by defining what light is. Essentially, light is radiant energy that we can see. It's an easy way to put it. And light is light, whether it's from the sun, fire, or electric light sources. 
but there are many variables about light, and we'll discuss a few of these today. Normally, normally we're looking at reflected light, unless you're a lighting geek like me that's looking up all the time. And our eyes have been designed to be sensitive to this energy. So what is visible light? This is one way we can represent that. It is radiant energy uh, that is represented by the electromagnetic spectrum. And the part that we see in color is a small band of visible light that our eyes are sensitive to from about uh, 380 to around 780 nanometers. And as you can see, all the colors of the rainbow are represented here. Important thing to remember is that light quality is very much related to the amount and intensity of the light spectrum in a particular light source. So our eyes have been designed to detect visual images on the retina located on the back of the eye. And we have photoreceptive, photosensitive receptors that allow us to distinguish color as well as light intensity. So the, so the rods, which we have a lot of, and they're scattered throughout the, uh, throughout the retina, they allow us to uh, distinguish between different light intensities at lower light levels. And at these levels, we have very few color cues. The cones, on the other hand, allow us to distinguish color at the, at the higher light levels. And we have far fewer of the cones. One reason there's more light, we need fewer receptors. But the other important thing to remember here is that uh, most of these cones are located in this section of the retina called the fovea. It's just a really small portion of the retina, but this is our area of optimum vision, uh, maximum focus. And that will relate to something we talk about later on. Okay, we're going to talk about a couple uh, color metrics here. And color rendering index, or CRI, is one of the ways that we can quantify color quality. So CRI indicates the effect of a light source on the color appearance of objects. And it's rated on a scale from 0 to 100, 0 being absolute worst and 100 being, being the best. And there are eight color samples that are rated and scored for accuracy. And this is how we come up with uh, CRI numbers. And it's not a perfect metric, but it works pretty well for most sources. But it's, we find that it's not as good for LEDs, however. And they're actually thinking of a, a new scale to uh, take into account the properties of LEDs. But we don't have that yet. So the sun would be considered a perfect 100. It has all of the colors of the rainbow that we saw a couple slides ago. And incandescent sources are a, a lot like that. They're very close to 100, although they're fairly weak in, in the blue spectrum. But this uh, high CRI is why retail stores and museums, for instance, like to use, still like to use halogen track lights. But that's beginning to change, and we'll talk about that later on, too. High pressure sodium, your basic street light, is an example of poor CRI. It's near 20, and it's also uh, very, very warm, very yellow light. So if you have a CRI of 85 or better, that's going to be considered very good. Uh, your better quality fluorescent is going to be an example of this uh, level of CRI. But keep in mind that not every task needs a high CRI. Uh, your retail, art museums, uh, art galleries, museums, um, yes, definitely. But maybe storing things in a warehouse, maybe, maybe not so much. The other significant color metric is correlated color temperature, and it's measured on a scale called uh, Kelvin, represented by the letter K. And this indicates the warmth or coolness of a light source. And in, in general terms, if your uh, color temperature is uh, less than 3200 K, that's uh, considered uh, a warm source. If it's uh, 4000 and above, that's considered to be uh, more of the cooler side of the spectrum. There's, there's more blue in the, in the light source. So color temperature, uh, the choice, is, is very subjective. Most people's skin uh, looks better under warmer sources, and one reason is because there's, there's more red in the spectrum, and it's, that's more, more appealing. However, we see most tasks better under the cooler sources. And the reason for this is because there's more blue in the spectrum, and it's been shown that this makes our pupils smaller, which is, allows us to see more clearly. We have 
fewer light rays that are not focused on the fovea. If you remember that from a few slides ago, that two degree field of vision, that's where we want, uh, that's where we can see most, most clearly. And if our pupils, pupils are smaller, uh, it's going to focus more light on that fovea. And higher color temperature lamps may also allow for energy savings for certain applications. So this is going to be another good slide to use your annotation tools. So get those ready. Uh, as you can see on this graph, the larger the number, the cooler the light source. And all sources have, uh, they don't have just a single number. Well, they, they may, but the, the lamp families themselves have, have a range of color temperatures. So if you look here at uh, incandescent and halogen, uh, all these sources are going to be around 2700 to, say, 30, 3100K. That, that's the basic range for incandescent halogen. When you get into fluorescent, you'll notice that they can go down as low as the incandescent sources, but they can go much, much higher, up to 6500 and actually even 8000K and higher. If, if you want to go with, with those color temperatures, it's possible with fluorescent. So what I'd like you to do with your annotation tools, if you could think of your application that you picked to, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this webinar, and use your uh, tool to indicate what your preferred uh, color temperature, what you think the color temperature should be for your particular application. And just uh, put that up here on the, on the screen. Again, fluorescent sources, they can vary their color temperature by adjusting the mixture of phosphor coating uh, types to make white light. So even though uh, phosphor, all phosphor appears white that are, that's used for lamps, there's variations that transform light either warmer or cooler. So this is how you can uh, make a fluorescent source either a warm white or a cool white, for instance. So we have a range here all the way from 3,500, 4,000, and all the way up to over 5,000K. Looks like around 4,000, 4,500 seems to be the popular choice for today. So thanks very much for that. Appreciate that feedback. So let's turn our focus now on some common lighting terms that will help us later on. Um, and this will, uh, by knowing these terms, it will help us know how to get light where you want it in a, an efficient way. So getting light where you want it, it's going to begin with a, a light source. So your, your input power is known as watts, and your light output is known as lumens. And when we put these together, we get a term called efficacy. Uh, and this is used of light sources, light bulbs. Um, and this is stated as lumens per watt. So think of miles per gallon. So, so to get the most light for the, for the energy, we want a high lumens per watt. Now the place where you want light to go is known as the work plane. And getting light to the work plane in an efficient manager, manner is going to save uh, energy and also save money. So a high efficacy rating is a good place to start. So this is a chart that I put together to help you look at the differences in efficacy. And just like we had a range with color temperatures, we also have a range in efficacy with different light sources. It's not uh, a specific number for that particular, particular family. So let's see how they, they compare. If, if you look in the upper left corner here, we've got your uh, incandescent, uh, the standard, and there's uh, halogen and improved halogen. Uh, and you can see, again, that there's, there's a wide range with the halogen IR or infrared versions being the, the, the incandescent sources that have the, the highest uh, efficacy. Uh, compact fluorescent is going to be even the worst. They're going to be better than any uh, incandescent source. And your linear uh, is going to be uh, about the, the same or usually better than compact fluorescent. Here's your T12s. But here we're going to, and we'll talk about these later on too, but you can see that any T8 or T5 is going to have a higher efficacy than any uh, T12. And that's very important to know. Uh, we won't go over all these, but important thing here that I just brought up is that some, of, most of these sources have peaked as far as their efficacy. Uh, they're as good as they're going to get, or just about as good. And only metal halide and, of course, LED that we're all hearing about has room for improvement. Uh, 
and with LED, the improvement could be as high as 200 lumens per watt someday. But 150 lumens per watt is not that far around the corner. I've seen some fixtures, some outdoor fixtures, that have lumens per watt uh, over 110 lumens per watt coming out of the fixture. Now remember, eff efficacy is just the starting point of the light journey. Next, we're going to see what fixtures allow the most light to actually escape the fixture and have a chance to uh, get to the work plane. So electric light sources are going to be housed in some sort of uh, luminaire or, or fixture. Uh, picking the right one is, is very important. Uh, and luminaire efficiency is, is basically it's a, it's a ratio of lamp lumens leaving the luminaire or fixture relative to the lumen output of the lamps going, going into it. And it's expressed as a percentage. However, the most efficient may not necessarily be, necessarily be the best for your application. So here we have a one lamp strip fixture that's 95% efficient, meaning that 95% of the lamp coming off of that lamp, 95% uh, of that light goes into the room, as opposed to this three lamp parabolic where only 65% of the light makes it into the room. 35% is bouncing around inside the fixture, being absorbed by surfaces, and doesn't make it even out of the fixture, much less get to the work plane. Now, a parabolic fixture efficiency can be greatly improved simply by installing an efficient retrofit lens. You could take this fixture, for instance, from 65% to 85% efficiency. So generally, the more light control, the lower efficiency as a, as a rule of thumb. So we already talked about light not getting out of the fixture, so what, let, let's talk about uh, when light hits an object, whether it's uh, a room surface or a fixture surface. So uh, some light rays will go directly from the lamp to the work plane, while others are going to be reflected either off a fixture component or perhaps uh, off the wall or objects in the room. Now, all objects reflect light to some degree and all objects uh, absorb some light. Now, if you have a semi-transparent material like we have in this illustration, uh, light is going to be transmitted through that material, and some of that light is going to be absorbed, uh, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully most of it is going to be going through that material if it's a fixture. So, so again, why are some fixtures more efficient than others? Again, we lose some light every time it strikes a surface or goes through a semi-transparent material. And would the color of the walls and the ceilings make a difference in getting light to the light plane? Absolutely. Light will also be reflected off walls and objects in the room. So one way you can improve efficiency is by uh, painting your surfaces or choosing uh, fabrics with a, um, a much, more, much higher re reflective quality. So saving, so you can save energy with lighter surfaces and more efficient fixtures. Foot candles represent the average amount of light spread over a work plane surface. So this is going to be the amount of light from one candle, one foot distance, and one square foot in space. An important thing to get out of this diagram, very important to know, is that light levels are greatly affected by distance. So here we have one foot distance, one foot candle, but when we go two feet away, we don't have half a foot candle, we have one quarter of a foot candle. And the reason for this is that uh, illuminance is affected by the distance squared, not just the, the distance. So the further you get away, the, the more that really, really matters. So when light finally reaches the work plane, we can measure the amount of light in foot candles with a, a light meter. Now the work plane could be a horizontal surface like uh, a desktop or the floor, or it could be a, a vertical surface like a whiteboard or maybe a retail display. So the, uh, the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, publishes the lighting handbook and they group light levels in uh, categories. So a few examples for your reference, uh, you can classify uh, a task as orientation and simple visual task and you know, less than one up to around 20 foot candles. But when you get into your common visual tasks like reading, 
uh, 30 to 75 is, is a range. And then you might have special visual tasks, and that range uh, is going to be 100 up to even 2,000 foot candles from, let's say, inspection up to brain surgery. You need a lot more light. But for a common visual task, um, you know, 30, 30 to, to 40 is usually actually pretty sufficient. Um, now keep in mind that many applications, ones that I see in the field, are actually currently overlit. So there are opportunities to, to save energy when retrofitting just by adjusting light levels lower. Now that's not always the case, but that's I often see that. And in case you've never seen a foot candle, here's what here's what one looks like. All right. So so now we finally got our light to the work plane, and that's great. That's our goal. But we also need to consider what happens to that light over time. And we have what's known as lamp lumen depreciation. So this describes the loss of light of a, of a light source over a period of time. And here you can see the common T12 lamp. And from the beginning, over time, over thousands of hours, you can see that it can lose 30% or more of its light over time versus the much better uh, T8 and T5, which maintains its uh, light loss of to less than 10%, than and it also lasts longer. So that's why it's a much, much better uh, light source and why everybody is switching to T8s and T5s over T12s. Now, there's, there's also other types of uh, light loss factors. But again, we'll focus on lumen depreciation. And this um, chart of spaghetti here, just shows other light sources, uh, like your uh, eight-foot T12 VHO, which can lose up to half, plus having a very short lamp life. Metal halide also has a very steep uh, lumen depreciation. So this is important because if you're either going to have to overlight a space to allow for this depreciation, or put up with that depreciation. Uh, as the lamps age. And there's other uh, depreciation factors. Uh, most of them involve dirt, dirt on the fixture, also room surfaces, and so on. So another good design concept is to know how far apart fixtures should be to give us even illumination uh, for different ceiling heights. So when we're talking about ambient light, this is, what, this is our goal. We want a nice, even illumination um, over the uh, over our desktops or the floor, wherever that uh, uh, work plane is. So this slide is going to have a one-question quiz. So again, have your annotation uh, tools ready. It should be an easy quiz, but uh, uh, see if you're paying attention. So this uh, this criterion is called uh, this this number is called spacing criterion, and it's the ratio used to calculate uh, the maximum uh, distance your fixtures should be apart to obtain an even pattern of light. So in this example, here in the bottom, let's say you went to a, look up a fixture and you went to the specification sheet and found that the spacing criterion was 1.1. That tells you that if you multiply that number times the ceiling height, that the most, the furthest apart that you should have that fixture is 11 feet, 1.1 times 10 feet. So how can proper spacing save energy. Well, it's possible that if you didn't pay attention that you had your fixtures too close together and you could have had them further apart and had fewer fixtures, less energy to light that space. So now here's our quiz. So what if the spacing criterion instead of 1.1 was 1 1.2? Okay, it's 1.2. So how far apart with a ceiling height of 10 feet should your fixtures be spaced? So uh, circle or point to what you think is, is the right answer, a 1.2 spacing criterion, 10-foot ceiling height. Keep in mind that this criterion applies to relatively open spaces. So if there's a lot of high cubicle walls, very dark, uh, you may want to space the uh, fixtures a little closer together. And everybody got the right answer, 12 feet. Excellent. Thank you. In this next section, we're going to discuss two common lamp families, 
incandescent and fluorescent. But first I want to go over some lighting terms to help us describe lamps. And unfortunately for some of you, this, is, this involves a little bit of math. Uh, lamps are designated by a letter, and this designates the relative shape of the lamp, and a number that designates the maximum diameter of the lamp in one eighth inches, eighths of an inch. So for example, down here for our T8, the T stands for tubular and the 8 stands for 8 eighths or 1 inch. So a T8 is a tubular lamp that is 1 inch in diameter. And over here we have a G which stands for a globe and it's 30 eighths of an inch or 3 and 3 quarters of inch for those of you that are good at math in your head. Uh, the T12 is 12 eighths, inch and a half. T5 is 5 eighths, uh, and so on. So hopefully you, you get the idea. So we're going to sta start our lamp family discussion with incandescent, and we'll talk about some ener uh, energy efficiency legislation that's been in the news uh, recently. So the incandescent has not fundament fundamentally changed since it was invented by Thomas Edison over 130 years ago. So why why are we still using them? Well, they're, they have a lot of advantages uh, in being uh, inexpensive. Uh, you can get them any, anywhere. People know how to use them. Screw them in, screw them out. Uh, color rendering is really good. But probably the number one reason for still using incandescent is because they're uh, easily dimmed. But the disadvantages really mount up uh, in not in favor of incandescent at all. As, we, as we've seen, the efficacy is very low. Uh, there's more uh, energy to heat than light. The lamp life is very short. And it's so bad that they've even passed some laws that essentially uh, ban uh, certain types because they can't meet certain efficacies. Keep in mind when we're talking about halogens that this is just another type of incandescent lamp, but it performs much better than standard incandescents. So with these new laws, um, you're going to have three bulb replacement options, either uh, an energy-saving incandescent, a compact fluorescent, uh, or an LED. So this law that was passed in 2007 uh, took effect of January 1st of last year, uh, which essentially eliminated your common 100-watt bulb, where this year the 75-watt bulbs were affected. Um, they can still be sold, but they can't, they, they've stopped making them. And next year, the 60 and the 40 watt bulb will be uh, going away. So, so one way to look at your choices is uh, good, better, and best. And I came up with this little chart to make a quick comparison uh, of the differences. With the energy saving incandescents here in uh, lamp life, very clear that they have the lowest hours, CFLs being better but LEDs being much, much better. Uh, the incandescents are the, the cheapest, CFLs more expensive, uh, and LEDs are m by far the most expensive. But when I update this slide, I'm going to take a few dollar signs away because they are getting quite a bit cheaper. Uh, the energy savings over a standard incandescent, here you can see 25%, uh, 75%, and uh, LEDs, again, I'm going to change this to uh, 80% at least. Uh, one of the considerations, uh, dimming incandescents, as we mentioned, dim well, CFLs, and any fluorescent doesn't dim well. Uh, LEDs mostly yes, but sometimes no. There's a lot of issues, and that's a whole other webinar. Uh, color quality, excellent with incandescents. CFLs, eh, very good. LEDs, there's a, there's a range, but you can get very excellent color quality. With, uh, with LEDs. So here's some energy saving bulb examples from GE Phillips and Sylvania, the big three of lamps. So the energy saving incandescents um, still make sense for applications with low hours of operation where you want dimming and if you want that warm color temperature shift that incandescents give you when you dim them. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. With the compact fluorescents, these are going to be for applications that have longer hours of operation, don't need to be dimmed, and they're not frequently switched because that burns out 
CFLs as well as linear fluorescent. With LEDs, because these are expensive, these are going to be best for applications with uh, very long hours of operation and where bulb replacement is uh, expensive or uh, difficult. LEDs can also dim and they don't mind frequent switching. You turn them on and off all the time, they're just great. So until recently, there just hasn't been an acceptable alternative for halogen reflector lamps for track lighting. CFLs were tried, but they've got a poor beam pattern. They just don't have good enough color quality. And uh, the compact metal halide lamps, uh, until recently, was a reasonable choice, but they have shortcomings in light quality and lamp life. So that brings us to the screw-in LED replacement directional lamps. And they've improved to the point where they are now an excellent alternative to halogen. So the energy savings, uh, the excellent color quality and long lamp life uh, make these a very uh, compelling choice. And they come in a variety of sizes. These PAR 38s, 30s, BR 30s, um, MR, MR 16s. But one thing to keep in mind is that even if, even if these LED replacement lamps didn't save any energy, it would still make sense to replace these because it's cheaper to buy one LED replacement, let's say at $40 instead of 10 halogens at $10 each over time. And think about the hassle and expense of changing all those lamps. However, they do save a lot of energy and they even qualify for generous uh, cash incentives through Energy Trust of Oregon and that often covers half the lamp cost. So in retail applications, we're seeing paybacks that could be after the incentive, uh, one to one and a half years. And there's prescriptive incentives for those uh, replacement PARs, but there's custom incentives for LED trackhead fixtures. But just like the uh, replacement lamps, you need to use an approved product and get your pr uh, project pre-approved. So let's switch gears now and go over and talk about linear fluorescent. So there's some some new laws that are, that are are going to affect what lamps and ballasts you can you can get. I know most of you replaced uh, your T12s, but for those that haven't, uh, you, you want to get rid of them. Uh, they they do save energy. These energy savers, uh, the 34 watt versus the 40 watt, uh, but they don't work well or at all in cold temperatures. Uh, and they're operated by inefficient magnetic ballast, and manufacturing for these ceased. Uh, ceased several years ago. And also the T12 lamps, the most common types, uh, they stopped making those as well. But you, there are exceptions, but you're likely going to have to pay more or accept some performance or uh, energy saving compromises if you want to stick with, with T12. Now because T12s are so bad, changing these out to something more efficient is should be an easy decision, but there's a lot of options. In the next few slides I'll try to sort these out for you. Um, so your high performance uh, uh, T8s is the lamp that you want to get. Any T8 is better than a T12, but the high performance version is, is, is the one that you want. Um, it's important to know that the T8s have the same uh, pin size and the same length as T12, so they make a great uh, retrofit. But the best performing T8s, again, are high performance, as well as the best uh, best ballast. And when you combine these two, you get a high performance system. And a savings of 40 to 50% is not uncommon. And in our territory, using the high performance uh, products is required in order to get an incentive. And to find out which lamps are high performance, here's the website where you can find the list. Now besides the full wattage, the 32 watt T8, uh, you can get a, a reduced wattage T8. And uh, these are also known as a high performance, so they can qualify for incentives. So if you already have a T8 system and you want to save about 10% energy, you can just switch out to these lower wattage lamps. And there's uh, 28 and 25 watt are the most common. They look just like another T8, but again, they put out a little less light, uh, but they perform much better than your 
uh, reduced wattage uh, energy saving T12s. Uh, one caution, they have to be used in conditioned spaces or an enclosed fixture. And again, this is be especially good if your space is overlit. Just swap out the, the lamps and your light output is reduced, um, but it's still an acceptable level. Now, a better strategy when using reduced wattage is to, is to retrofit. Uh, this is going to include a new ballast and uh, new modifications, especially if you already have an uh, existing uh, T12 system, uh, which you can't just put a T8 lamp in because it's not going to be compatible with, with the ballast. Also, if you have an older T8 installation, let's say around 10 years old or older, that ballast is probably due for replacement anyway. So it makes sense to uh, replace the lamps and replace the ballast, um, which will qualify for the, um, uh, an incentive from Energy Trust as well. But even though I like reduced wattage lamps, I like people to look at the full wattage, the 32-watt TH first, because it might be possible to reduce the number of lamps when you retrofit. You could be more aggressive in your uh, lamp reduction. So another way to improve your fluorescent upgrade is by using a, uh, a recessed tropper kit. So this is great if you have an existing T12 or even uh, an existing T8 in some cases, if you're overlit. With, uh, with this kit, you're going to get new lamp holders. Um, you can also, here's your lamp holders, you can also get a new, uh, new reflector. And it's going to reposition these lamps. If you went from four to two, for instance, uh, instead of having the lamps on the outside or close to the middle, uh, this kit repositions your lamps. And with the new reflector, improves the efficiency. And uh, again, another reason to reduce the number of lamps. But the best option in retrofitting your fluorescent is to also include a new advanced retrofit uh, a new lens. Uh, this is going to make your fixture more efficient. Plus, it's going to give it an updated look. And, and I've worked with a lot of uh, companies that have done this type of application. Uh, in fact, these retrofit strategies are so good that sometimes you can even go all the way down to one lamp. OK, since I can't take everybody out in the field with me, I took this picture to help us uh, talk about and put together some of the things that we talked about. So kind of look at this picture and see what what do we see that would give us some clues on what's happened to this fixture and how we could retrofit them? Uh, maybe one of the most obvious is that uh, we got some empty lamp holders. This means some lamps have been removed, either one of the two ballasts that are in this uh, in this uh, ballast compartment has failed, or they just thought it was overlit, which is very very common. Uh, you'll notice that the the housing is very uh, dirty and discolored. That's going to have an effect on the light coming out as well. Um, upper left-hand corner, you can see that um, our lens cover isn't closing. And they often have these very cheap, sometimes even plastic uh, clips on them. And they break or get bent. Um, and that, that's a very common thing. Also, there's no lens. They're supposed to have a lens. It's gone. Um, so there's a lot of things that are that are happening with this. So what would you do if you found this in your installation? Would you relamp and reballast? Would you put a kit? Would you put a new fixture in? These are the questions you need to ask. So what about T5s? This is a question I get asked quite a bit. Since they're thinner, wouldn't they always be better? Well, the answer is sometimes. Uh, there's two basic types. There's the standard T5, and then there's the T5 high output version. Uh, keep in mind that they're, they don't fit in the standard T12 or T8 lamp holders. This is because they have miniature five pins, and they're about two inches shorter. So it's not meant to be a retrofit lamp. So T5s are better when you use them in new fixtures. And some examples of this is an uh, indirect fixture, especially when you can have uh, the lamps, uh, one lamp end to end along uh, an indirect fixture, uh, you get the maximum efficiency. Also, uh, an advanced lens uh, fixture, 
and high bays is very common for using uh, T5HOs. Uh, but keep in mind that any of these applications can also use the high performance T8s. And in many ways, I preferred the high performance T8 over uh, T5 or T5HO. One reason is performance, and another reason is cost. Okay, well, if you have an industrial fixture uh, that looks something like uh, like this one, a cross section, and they're T12s, and and you have eight-foot lamps, these are eight-foot lamps in this uh, illustration. Uh, you might have uh, your basic slimline, which has a single pin. Or you might have an HO high output or a very high output T12 lamp. And those you definitely want to upgrade. And what you can do is replace each of these 8-foot T12 lamps with two 4-foot T8 lamps by using, using a kit. And this kit gets attached to the, uh, the old channel. That's all that's left. And you get new lamp holders, uh, not only at the end, but also in the middle to accommodate uh, two four-foot lamps. And sometimes you can add uh, a reflector. But sometimes it makes more sense just install an entire new fixture rather than messing with, with a kit. So you've got two options there. So here's a, an example of what an actual one looks like. So replace this or, or retrofit it. Again, to retrofit, you can remove everything, the lamp holders, lamps, this reflector, all you have left is this basic uh, metal gutter and, and uh, electrical power. And you can attach a new kit directly to this. And from underneath, it looks just like new. But again, sometimes it makes sense to put a whole new, new fixture. But what happens with these, these lamp holders tend to get pushed out. Hopefully you can tell in the picture here. Sometimes the lamps will even fall out. But they also get very corroded. Uh, this reflector, again, is not reflecting very much. The darkening indicates a lamp that is very old. Um, but the key decision for upgrading is if you have T12 lamps and if the ballast is, is old. So one reason or one criteria for uh, retrofit or a uh, new fixture, if you retrofit, you can use a, uh, a, a technician that isn't paid as much as a journeyman electrician that's required for, for new fixtures. So let's uh, summarize what we've learned. Um, get rid of T12s. Uh, always go with the high performance T8s. Look first for the full wattage, the 32 watt high performance before you look at the reduced wattage options, which is still a good option. And also rule out retrofit options before you decide that you need new fixtures and decide if our uh, lower light levels would be appropriate. Again, very often spaces are, are overlit. And even consider uh, LED tropper upgrade options if, if you have very long hours of operation. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't uh, make good sense at this point. So speaking of LED, what about LED applications? So we already looked at directional lamps and why they're such a good uh, LED application right now. But others to consider are uh, recessed cans. They're another application where LEDs can work really well, uh, especially if incandescent lamps are currently being used. But you could also swap out uh, CFL down lights just because they're so inefficient. Um, and because LEDs like a cold refrigerated display cases work really well with LEDs. Uh, outdoor signage. This is uh, another new application for LED that works really well. Uh, recessed troffers, we touched on those. Um, and these need to be less expensive and save more energy uh, in order to compete against the fluorescent because it's such a good option and an inexpensive option right now. There's some outdoor fixture applications like parking garages, gas station canopies, wall packs. Uh, these have been shown to be cost effective and they save a lot of energy. Uh, and there's also some uh, recently announced uh, incentives through Energy Trust prescriptive incentives for these applications that you see. And don't forget exit signs. Now in the future, not that far from now, you're going to, uh, LEDs are going to be good for more uh, outdoor fixtures, especially the architectural types and ones with uh, higher wattages will become more cost effective. 
some of those are cost effective now. Uh, high bays, uh, again, all these need long hours of operation to be cost effective. And we're just now seeing some good indirect LED lighting fixtures. Uh, we won't cover a lot of, on LED, but for more detailed information, uh, I have a, a webinar uh, dedicated to LEDs, and we also have some seminars coming up in September here in Portland and, and Salem that you can learn more about LEDs. So let's switch gears now and look at lighting control options. And because of limited time, we're only going to talk about occupancy sensor controls today. Uh, occupancy sensors turn the lights off or lower when no one is home. Um, even though people have, some people have had a bad experience with occupancy sensors, they're getting smarter and more reliable. And it's important to pick the right type for your application, which will improve your chances of success. So here's a, a wall switch, very common. Uh, this is a ceiling sensor. And you can also put sensors right on high bay fixtures, very common application. So the most important thing when you're talking about a passive infrared sensor is that they need line of sight in order to, in order to detect that someone's there. Uh, just like most sensors, uh, you can ha they can be uh, you can replace a regular switch, or you can use one that goes to the ceiling, uh, or high up on the wall, or directly on a, a light fixture. And you may have turned the, heard the term vacancy sensor instead of occupancy sensor. It's called a vacancy sensor if you have to manually turn the occupancy sensor on for the lights to come on. An occupancy sensor automatically turns the lights on, and both types automatically turn the lights off. And your passive infrared uh, is good for uh, small private offices, large, any large open space is going to work well with the passive infrared. And they're also the cheapest sensor. Now, ultrasonics work a little differently. They detect a disturbance in the force, I call it, especially movement toward or away from the sensor. But sometimes that sensor range can leak outside of the intended coverage area, so they can be prone to false ons, say a hallway next to a room with an open door. So these are best for rooms that have a door that's usually closed. And here's a couple of the applications that they're good for. And these are a little bit more expensive than passive infrared. Now, sometimes if you need to improve the performance and reliability of occupancy sensors, you can combine uh, two sensor technologies like the infrared and the ultrasonic. And this is going to help eliminate the false ons and the false offs. But as you can expect, this is going to cost more. Some of the applications where you see this type is classrooms, conference rooms, uh, restroom where you have stalls. Uh, you don't have line of sight, and then smaller offices that have uh, obstructions. A, re a relatively recent development are uh, occupancy sensors that are wireless. So it's always been difficult and expensive to retrofit the ceiling sensors because you have to add new wires, sometimes conduit. Uh, but uh, they've come down in cost so that these have uh, become a, a really, really good option. And there's two basic types. One uh, uses a battery. They're still going to need power, even if you don't wire them. Um, so Lutron uses a, a long life battery, where Leviton, for example, has a self-powered switch and a sensor. So how much can you expect to save? Here's, here's an example. And a lot depends on the ownership of the space. For instance, if you have a private office, uh, the person in the office knows when they're coming and going and could possibly turn the lights on and off themselves without needing a sensor. Uh, where a conference room, people don't own the space, they're not sure if they should turn the lights on and off, um, and you might have long time in between use for that conference room. So the savings are better. Warehouses, especially areas that are infrequently uh, visited, those savings can be quite high. So in summary, these uh, controls are going to work really well. Make sure you get the right type, uh, infrared, ultrasonic, uh, dual sensor, uh, the right type. Decide if you need a wall switch or a ceiling, for instance. Install them correctly. Make sure they're pointed in the right direction. Uh, and there's, there's different ways you can commission sensors. Uh, you can 
adjust the timeout setting, the sensitivity, field of view. Uh, these are all things that you can adjust and make them work better. So they're great savings when it's done right. And if you want more information, in fact, a lot more information, uh, Lighting, Control, uh, Lighting Controls Association has excellent free tutorials and uh, information you can get there. Okay, we're going through this pretty fast, but we're getting close to the end. So hopefully most of you are thinking of some energy-saving opportunities at your facility. So contacting PGE could be one of your best next steps, uh, next, uh, you know, good place to start. So even though our, our website uh, is a good place, I encourage you to contact one of our uh, uh, energy-saving specialists here. Uh, for commercial customers, call Paula Conway. For industrial customers, uh, John, John Maloney. And if you're not a PG customer, contact your local utility and find out what's available for you. But here, in the, for PG service territory, um, you can take advantage of cash incentives. Here's some examples. Uh, the high performance T8, still very popular, still excellent incentives for that. Uh, for LED, you have recess down lights, those screw in par lamps. Uh, outdoor fixtures are getting more and more popular all the time. And then troffer kits, uh, fluorescent probably now in the near future, uh, LED troffers, uh, but there are incentives for that. And lighting controls, great incentives for those. Now, if you have a measure that's uh, not on the list, like, uh, like high bays, which we didn't talk about today, uh, you can still qualify for a custom incentive uh, if it qualifies. For your project to qualify, you have to have a, a payback of greater than one year, 25% uh, project savings, and uh, it needs to be uh, cost effective. If you go with fluorescent, you have to have the high performance versions, and if you go with LED, it needs to be a qualified product, one that's on the lighting design lab uh, list or uh, th this link for Lighting Design Lab, they have their own list, but you can also have the Design Lights Consortium list and the Energy Star list. That's your launching pad at this website. Very important that your project must be pre-approved in order to get incentives. So to wrap things up, this is a little visual summary to help you remember what we talked about today. So if you have uh, existing fluorescent system, you can go with high performance. Uh, T8s, maybe reduced wattage, and retrofit kits or new fixtures, uh, either fluorescent or LED. If you have incandescent bulbs of some type, you can go to the energy, energy efficient incandescents, uh, when appropriate, compact fluorescents, and light emitting diodes, especially with long hours of operation. And if you have areas that are often vacant, don't forget occupancy sensors. So again, we, there's many more lighting options that we just didn't have time to cover today. I know this has been a whirlwind tour and appreciate everyone that's uh, stuck around. So many of these topics and other topics are, we, are gonna be covered in half day seminars that are scheduled for September. So now I wanna turn it over to Beth for some announcements and also questions from the audience. Beth. Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to thank Mark, and I want to remind you of some upcoming webinars or seminars, starting with the ones that Mark mentioned. Um, in September, we have human-centric lighting on September the 24th in Portland and 26th in Salem, and LED indoor lighting and LED outdoor lighting uh, on September 25th. Indoor is in the morning, and outdoor is in the afternoon, and that's in Portland. Before we proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar, I'd like to remind everyone that you can continue to submit questions to me through chat and I will ask them of Mark. Within a few days, we'll send you the follow-up email with a recording of this session and the PDF of the slides. And right now, I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the, the polling survey, which I just opened in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you could take a few moments to fill that out, we really appreciate your feedback and we do use it to improve future webinars. And now for the question and answer portion of the webinar. Mark, our first question is, do all T8s require retrofitting to electric ballasts? Uh, the, the answer to that is uh, yes. Uh, if you have 
uh, T12 and you want to upgrade to T8s, uh, the magnetic ballast is not going to work uh, with the new T8. Uh, actually, it, it, it'll light it up, but it's going to burn it out really fast because it's going to be operating at, at a much higher uh, amperage. And, uh, and if you have an, an older T8, uh, you may want to replace that aging uh, electric ballast with the uh, high performance uh, electronic ballast. These, as you might expect, have improved greatly over the years. Uh, lamp life for T8s has actually improved. You can actually get uh, a, a T8 that lasts for over 80,000 hours now, uh, which is unheard of not that long ago. And your electronic ballasts are going to, uh, should last <laughs> at least that long, uh, especially if they're not, uh, not overheated. But yes, um, you're going to have to upgrade your ballast along with your lamps going from uh, T12 to T8 or your older uh, T8s, you want to put the, Im the improved electronic ballast uh, as well. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, our next question is, what is the brand name for some of the advanced lens kits or lighting reps that I can get them through? Uh, well, th there's, there's several. Um, if you want to, you know, a, a couple, there's, uh, you know, Lithonia is one. Uh, you can get some, uh, Envirobrite is one that I'm thinking of. Uh, I know Cree makes uh, some, some kits. So there, there's several out there, but if you want to send an email, I can uh, send you a, a longer list of that. And, uh, and if you want to come to our uh, seminar coming up in September, our presenter has has a long list of, uh, of, of qualifying or good good advanced lens uh, kits that you can that you can get, but most of your your major manufacturers and suppliers like uh, Cooper and Lithonia and Hubble and uh, they have them as well as some you know smaller companies that uh, uh, specialize in uh, retrofit upgrades. Thanks, Mark. Our next question is. Um, are ballasts more expensive than lamps? And if so, how much? Well, ballasts, uh, they're, they're more expensive than lamps, as you might expect. Uh, a good high-performance T8 lamp you can usually get for around $4. Uh, uh, might be more expensive in smaller quantities. Uh, could be less than that in larger quantities. Electronic ballasts, you might look for a cost of around $15 or so. Uh, some of your better ones will cost more, and, uh, and again, in quantity, you can get those uh, less. Thank you, Mark. And I think we have time for at least one more question here. Are the new electric ballasts simple to swap in for old T12 magnetic ballasts? Give me a lot of ballast questions. Sure. Well, again, uh, even though we're going to LEDs, uh, fluorescent upgrades, for the time being, uh, especially with lower hours of operation, is uh, is still a good uh, retrofit option. I encourage people uh, not necessarily to wait for LEDs to become uh, less expensive and uh, get those T12s out and go with the fluorescent. Uh, it's it's relatively easy as far, as far as you know sticking them in the in the lamp holders and and so on. But there's complexities in attaching the wiring, and it's best left to an electrician. Uh, that knows what he's what he's doing. There's uh, uh, also there's there's instant start electronic ballast, and there's uh, programmed rapid start program start that um, have different wiring patterns. And you also have lamp holders that are uh, different also. So there's some subtle things that you need to know, but subtle but important things that you need to know before uh, taking on a, a retrofit yourself. It, it, it can be done, but you really should use a uh, electrician or a retrofit company that has the uh, uh, a technician and the proper credentials uh, and experience to do it right. Thanks, Mark. And um, our last question is, if our in-house maintenance people retrofit our fixtures from T12 to T8, will we still be eligible for Energy Trust incentives? Uh, the, the answer is yes. 
but the, the key point here, the two key points is that you have to use approved equipment. You need to use high performance lamps. You need to use high performance ballast. And you need to get pre-approval for your project. So you can't jump in, do your project, and then call up and say, now I want my, my incentive, I want my rebate. Uh, you need to uh, do the uh, application form. It comes in the form of a spreadsheet with some information, a place to put down your model numbers for your lamps and ballast. And you submit that to the Energy Trust, and they get back to you and bless your project and say, it's great. If you do what you said you're going to do, we'll give you an incentive. Um, so get your project pre-approved, get your paperwork turned in, wait for that approval, uh, and then um, do the project, and then do the follow-up paperwork and get your cash incentive. It's really pretty easy. So I highly encourage you to um, find a, a lighting trade ally that is experienced in doing lighting retrofits, because it is a specialty. It may seem simple enough, but it, there's some subtle things that are very important, and having an experienced person uh, handle the installation as well as the paperwork is, I think, very important. Thank you, Mark. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We'll stay online for a while in case any of you would like to ask any additional questions. Thank you again, and we hope to see you at a future webinar.